Good evening, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. America has an elected ceremony every four years, every two years. We replace our leaders. We have frequent elections because we trust them, because they're transparent. That's a democracy. And yes, there can be unhappiness during the election cycle. Right now, there's unhappiness everywhere with new allegations against Donald J. Trump and revelations about Hillary Clinton's email and her colleagues. But in any event, it's transparent. We see it. We talk about it all the time. What if we lived in a place, a country, where there was no transparency, where there was no succession, where there was only strength forever? Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast joins me tonight. We're going to talk about such a country. It wasn't obvious these last seven decades since the revolution of Mao Zedong, but it's obvious now with the intention of the fifth generation leader, the big boss, the president, Xi Jinping, with his intention, suddenly the Chinese revolution is done. Strong man. Gordon, a very good evening to you. What do we believe Xi Jinping wants to make of himself in these coming years? There's multiple reporting, John, from a number of different sources, New York Times, FT and a number of Asian sources that Xi Jinping wants to stay on beyond his two terms. There is an institutionalized norm in the Communist Party that a secretary general stays on only for 10 years. Xi Jinping looks like he wants to stay on indefinitely. Is there any precedent for this, Gordon, since Mao Zedong? Well, Mao stayed on for a very long time, but from Jiang Zemin, who was the third generation leader, and Hu Jintao, um, they adhered to the precedent, and many people have said, you know, this shows China's strength, that it is institutionalized succession. Well, guess what, John? They haven't. Arthur Waldron, the University of Pennsylvania, joins. Arthur, uh, we all recall the story of George Washington when he chose not to be king, and it was said that he was recognized as the strongest man on earth at that moment. By logic, this, resign- uh, this uh, intention of Xi Jinping it make him, makes him the weakest man on earth. Good evening to you, Arthur. Good evening, John. Um, I think that you're quite right, because I think that if you have a, a clear program in mind, and you have support for getting it done, then you ought to be able to get it done in a certain number of years. And she is, by all reports, extremely ambitious, although it should be noted that he has actually institutionalized nothing new. All he's done is fight with his factional opponents uh, since he has been in. So in a way, what he's doing is treating himself the way the party treats China, which is to sort of kick all the problems down the road, down the road, down the road, never face them and say, let's fix them now. He should, he should fix them, and then after his term is up, he should get out, of course. Gordon? Arthur, um, you know, many China watchers, not you, but many China watchers said, you know, the Communist Party has been able to ensure smooth successions, because successions, of course, are the weak point in any political system, but especially an authoritarian one. And with all this new reporting coming out, um, it appears that basically there were no rules in the Communist Party and that really the system hasn't been reformed at all. I mean, where do you come out on this? Well, I think you're absolutely right. When they said that the constitution of the country went down below the party over the people, but the party was above, above the constitution, I started saying, well, is there a separate party playbook? And I I think the answer is obviously no. There are no rules whatsoever at the party level. I'd also note that in traditional China, this issue of naming the heir apparent, and traditionally it's done immediately. Immediately the new monarch comes in, he says who the next one's going to be. This is called the root of the state, the guogun problem. And uh, I think the fact that they have have labeled it that for thousands of years shows that they have a lot of wisdom about how their system works. Puzzle, Arthur. Uh, what does this do to the Communist Party's teachings? The, uh, they do maintain these Mandarin-like schools where they repeat the, the virtues of communism and Maoism. Does this, does this wreck all that? Well, that's a terrific question, Gordon, because I think... Uh, <sighs> What's happened in other countries is that um, 
communism turned into Leninism, turned into Stalinism, turned into Maoism, and now in North Korea you've got an ism which really has nothing in common, nothing that Marx would recognize. Uh, it's inevitable that if Xi Jinping is, is the power, that what has hitherto been communist teaching is going to change so that it's, it's his teaching. And God only knows what that's going to be, uh, because it, it, it's, it's a very, very. It, it, it's both vital that somehow these people should, we hope or not, or not, believe some sort of something about what they're doing and why they're doing it, and it also has to be his. But if you read his book about China, it's clear that he he is not a systematic thinker, and he does not have a coherent vision that he can convey to anybody of of, of what he's going to do or what's going to happen. Uh, Gordon, there's been an incident. I, I do not have all the facts. Uh, you and Arthur do. What's happened with the military in these last days and how it might relate to this sudden decision by Xi Jinping? Well, in, on Tuesday, um, more than a thousand demobilized soldiers, all wearing green fatigues, lined up outside of the Ministry of National Defense in Beijing, protesting that they haven't gotten jobs, haven't gotten benefits. They sang patriotic songs, they chanted they waved flags, and they unnerved the Communist Party, because here you have a force that can organize itself, which has a lot of sympathy in society, which is now protesting. Arthur, is this in, a, in, in some fashion connected to Xi Jinping's defensiveness, his demand that uh, army officers pledge allegiance to him, his wearing uniforms all the time? Is, is there a weakness going on here that we can see in this protest? Well, probably the greatest uh, Chinese intellectual of the last century, Hu Shi, who a uh, great genius ambassador to the U.S., said that if you want to keep China united, you have to keep the pressure down. Because if it's a little bit relaxed, a little bit loose, and there's not constantly being pushed at, it will stick together. But if somebody comes in and tries to tie it all up tight, it will all crack and begin to break into pieces. And he used this as an explanation for why attempts to centralize government in the early part of the 20th century had instead led to the fractionization of China among contending soldiers. And it seems to me that the same applies now. This is a time to loosen up, loosen up on everything, stop pushing wars, stop all of this stuff, and above all, uh, do not try to make yourself the keystone. Uh, even having just some principles would be better. But this, this is the exact wrong direction to go. And these, these soldiers are really, really angry, and they're not going to forget. And they're a tiny drop in the bucket of what's out there. And they've all got families, and they live all over China. Gordon? Arthur, um, the story here, of course, is that by the end of next year, Xi Jinping's reorganization of the Chinese military is going to result in about a $300,000 uh, $300, people reduction in force. So the problem that we see yesterday um, is going to just get worse. And indeed, there's a real issue with the People's Liberation Army in that their budget increases have far outstripped economic growth and central government spending. It seems to me that there's going to be some real problems between the party and the military going forward. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Gordon. And, of course, we know that even 11 years ago when we had an incident that involved both the government and the military for a highly sensitive issue of the spy plane being downed, it was only when we went to the military that we were able to arrange a solution. The government was powerless to do it. Uh, so we have a situation now where the people who are in charge of the military are not of the military, and whether there's some a bond of, of glue there or not, we don't know. Arthur, quick final question. Bo Shilai is in jail. His wife is in jail. Are they smiling when they hear this news of Xi Jinping making himself dictator? Yes, I, I think that anybody who aspired, and I think they would probably aspire to a system in which they could play a part, with, along with the various other dukes, barons, and lords of China. And I think they understand quite rightly that uh, overreach in the direction of one-man control is going uh, uh, to lead, in fact, to pluralization. 
Arthur Waldron, law professor of international relations in the Department of History at the University of Pennsylvania, Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast. There's a dictator rising in China. 21st century trouble. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor with Gordon Chang, The Daily Beast, my colleague and co-host, the new dynamic and young president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, within these last days, urges China to engage in talks, to talk about the relations, commercial, cultural, physical, security, metaphysical, between mainland China and Taiwan. But... From the report I'm reading in Reuters, China has not responded. Puzzled. Gordon, is that correct? China has not responded to the request from the new president of Taiwan? Yeah, that's correct, because Taiwan will not accept the 1992 consensus, which is an agreement from 1992 between the old Taipei government and Beijing that they both agreed that they were part of the same country, but they just disagreed as to where the capital was. Was it Taipei or Beijing? Tsai Ing-wen does not agree to the 1992 consensus, but she is willing to talk. We welcome Joe Bosco, a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Joe, a very good evening to you. And a little witticism, I remember once upon a time, I believe the president or prime minister of Sweet, of Finland was asked, was he worried about Joseph Stalin's Russia right next door? And he said, oh my, no, not worried at all. It's much too big for us to absorb. I tell that story because it looks very much here that it's China that's fearful of Taiwan. Why? What is Xi Jinping to fear from the new president? Good evening to you, Joe. Good evening, John and Gordon. Nice to talk to you again. Uh, China, in fact, has a lot to fear from uh, from the leaders of Taiwan, primarily because they are democratically elected. And that's the virus that China fears will infect uh, t- uh, China itself. Uh, that's always been the, the critical factor in, in uh, the China-Taiwan relationship since the days when Taiwan shifted from a dictatorship to a democracy. So China fears very much the example that the Taiwanese people are showing uh, that the Chinese people may uh, emulate at some point. And Tsai Ing- uh, Ing-wen is a new president, and she is dynamic. Uh, but there was a previous president who was also popularly elected. He left office does China fear all presidents, or is there something particular about President Tsai? Yeah, they, they fear the, the institution of democracy per se on, on the island of Taiwan. But, of course, the KMT, the Kuomintang government, is, was considered more pro-China than the DPP, which is considered to be independent-minded. So they clearly, this is their worst fear, that, that Tsai Ing-wen and the Democratic Progressive Party did so well in the election. But they... They have no truck for any democratic system in Taiwan. They want it to be subject to to the PRC and the, the way it governs things. Gordon? Joe, it, it's even worse for Beijing because it's not just a democracy on the island of Taiwan. It's a democracy where people don't think that they're Chinese. If you look at opinion surveys, um, it shows somewhere between 65 to 70 percent of the people view themselves as Taiwanese only, not Chinese. And that means they don't buy this whole notion of Taiwan being a part of China. It really means that Taiwan wants to go its own way, and because it's democratic, it very well may do so. I mean, how do you see this? I think you're, you're absolutely right, Gordon, and that it's, it's clearly the growing Taiwanese sense of identity uh, over the years, uh, which is happening every day. The older folks who identified themselves as Chinese or, or both Chinese and Taiwanese are dying off, People are being born every day whose only country that, the, that they know is Taiwan. And so the, the identification, the sense of identity with, 
with China is, is diminishing daily. And the Chinese leadership knows that, and they know the time, in that sense, is not on their side. They always thought time would, uh, would be on their side in terms of economic relations, that they would draw Taiwan into a, an integrated system with, with China. But meanwhile, this parallel development was going on where the people in Taiwan were saying, wait a minute, we're Taiwanese, not Chinese. And we saw with the uh, uh, sunflower movement that broke out uh, last year, just how, how vivid those, those feelings are among the Taiwanese people, particularly the younger generation. I've long been puzzled by the fear expressed by nations around the world of Taiwan, as if it, you, uh, in opening good relations with Taiwan, you would, uh, you would risk the wrath of mainland China. Now, things have changed, Joe. China's being aggressive towards everyone in its neighborhood. It's acting belligerent, and Xi Jinping is talking about becoming a dictator in some fashion. Does that mean that... Taiwan can expect to be embraced by the nations of the world and no longer ignored by it? Well, that's a very difficult question, John. One would think that they would see their own interests and Taiwan's as being coincidental, but they do fear they have, they have deep economic ties with, the, with China, and so they worry about the, the, the retribution that China could in, inflict on them if they get too close to Taiwan or identify with Taiwan's aspirations so it's and you know you're talking about small countries in the region but look at the united states we're the most powerful country in the world and yet we are intimidated by that fact that that china could injure our our, uh, economic relations with them if we do things that are too sympathetic to the to the people of taiwan gordon joe you know you're absolutely right in your description but I think that we'd have much better relations with China if we had stronger relations with Taiwan, because we'd be saying to the Chinese, we're no longer afraid of you. And if the Chinese felt that way, then clearly, um, you know, the Chinese would respect us. And I think our relations on a whole, uh, a whole a range of issues would get better immediately. Um, where, where do you stand on that? Again, agree with you, Gordon. I think that the the entire policy of strategic ambiguity that we've uh, been living with for the last two decades uh, is absurd. That policy, in effect, states that the United States is not sure whether it will defend Taiwan if China attacks it. Uh, it would depend on the circumstances, is the way our our leaders have put it. Uh, this sends a very bad, uh, damaging message to China, meaning. The U.S. is not certain that they will defend Taiwan. Therefore, if they're not certain, let's make it as difficult as possible for the U.S. to ever intervene. So we have this muddled message, and we're not making a clear commitment to the security and defense of Taiwan. And I, I agree with you. That's, that's inviting China to be adventuristic and, and uh, think that they can uh, get away with some kind of a, a move on Taiwan, and we will allow it to happen. Joe, Joe Bosco, Senior Associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast. Uh, Gordon, a final detail. Is President Tsai, Tsai Ing-wen, she popular doing making these statements? Is, is that applauded? It, it is applauded. I mean, she's losing popularity, but not because of China policies, just because the natural loss of popularity right. understand. is the leader. Gordon Chang, I'm John Batchelor. John Batchelor with my colleague Gordon Chang, and we're off to Hong Kong. We welcome David Fife, an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong, Wall Street Journal editorial. David, a very good morning to you. R- writing most recently, the Wall Street Journal has looked at a young man, Joshua Wong. Who is he, and how does he involve Thailand? Good morning to you. Good morning, John. Well, Joshua Wong is the most prominent student leader of the democracy movement in Hong Kong. He is all of uh, 19 years old. He was 17 and 18 when he was leading 
at the barricades, uh, the mass pro-democracy protests two years ago. He was even younger than that, about 14, when he first came to prominence in Hong Kong, leading a, a successful student protest against what would have been the imposition of a propagandistic curriculum in the schools in Hong Kong. So at the ripe old age of 19, he's actually quite well known in Hong Kong as a as a leader of, of the liberal uh, pro-democracy forces. And last week, he tried to travel to Thailand to speak to some university audiences there and was turned back at the airport by Thai authorities, apparently at the request of the Chinese government. Gordon? David, um, in, in Thailand right now, this might be an exaggeration, but it looks like it's becoming a Chinese colony. I mean, when the Chinese can tell the Thais to turn back Joshua Wong, it really doesn't seem that they've got an independent foreign policy anymore. Well, this is a, an issue increasing uh, in the region and, and really around the world where the Chinese government is trying to uh, assert itself and really target and silence critics all around the world. It's succeeding most effectively so far in, in its immediate neighborhood and in Southeast Asia. So, for example, Joshua Wong himself was similarly turned away last year at the airport in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and Malaysian police authorities at the time said that they had done it so as not to hurt their relations with the Chinese government. There have been similar cases, uh, especially in Thailand, of, uh, of governments uh, looking to curry favor with Beijing by sending back, in some cases, large numbers of uh, would-be refugees. Uh, for example, there were some journalists, there were more than 100 Uyghurs whom uh, the Thai authorities sent back to China, repatriated last year. And it's certainly a way in which the, the Chinese government is trying to uh, extend the arm of some of its lawless tactics at home. We have a story here, David. You know it very well. The last thing you want to do on radio is to tell people to pay no attention to the five billion other creatures in the room, because that's what they're going to pay attention to. Okay, there are five billion other creatures in the room. Does China realize that it emphasizes exactly what it doesn't want to promote when it does this? Well, that's a, that's a million-dollar question. Uh, it, it, some people noted, for example, last week after Joshua Wong was turned away in Thailand, that instead of speaking to a few university auditoriums in Bangkok and getting some some perfunctory local press coverage uh, the the uh, the blocking that Beijing had engineered had actually allowed Joshua Wong to speak to a global audience right. he was delivering press conferences when he returned to Hong Kong and here we are talking about it after all that is uh, certainly a, a risk uh, or a mistake that, that that Beijing makes but from their perspective they might balance that against the intimidation that they successfully mount against their critics uh, at home in Hong Kong and overseas, and, uh, and they seem to continue to want to do it. Gordon? You know, David, it just seems to me that, uh, you know, as you point out, this is counterproductive. I mean, from the Communist Party perspective, uh, they get what they want, but at the end of the day, it is just so injurious to their own interests because they think that they can force people to do things but it has consequences that, of course, don't help them in the long run. I just see this as an utter failure of Chinese foreign policy to understand the effect of what they're doing. That's certainly the, the, the assertion, the calculation that Joshua Wong and his, and his colleagues are making. They said after he was turned back that this sort of uh, silencing, attempted silencing, will only have their cause be heard right. more broadly, that, that certainly could be the case. And uh, it, it is an interesting contest, though, the contest, for example, for influence in, in the region. Uh, there is a, a pattern that, that Beijing can point to where uh, many of its neighbors are becoming uh, more and more willing to do its dirty work. And, uh, and for them, that's certainly a goal that they're pushing toward. And I think it's worth all observers to, to watch uh, you know, various signs, whether it comes to Hong Kong Democrats, other dissidents, or other strategic issues, just how the, uh, the countries in this region uh, act over time when it comes to these Beijing requests. Duterte, you have much experience traveling in the Philippines. I remember your reporting after a typhoon and the U.S. Navy sent an, a warship in to help with the repairs. Duterte is ending exercises with the U.S. Navy. Maybe there are other things that he's going to end. 
At this point, your observation of Duterte, is he following a course that's sustainable? Is it, does he have a does he have a, 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 a an end game here? These these spontaneous rejections of the U.S. Well, here is another major example of a regional player shifting its policies uh, in, in response to and to cater to Chinese government opinion. Now, that's not exclusively why Duterte is is shifting Philippine policy and, and tilting away from the United States. There are various ideological and, and domestic political reasons. But there's no question that in the, in the quick three months that, that he has been the new president of the Philippines, he is reorienting his uh, country's foreign policy dramatically. He's talked about kicking the remaining United States troops out of the rest of southern Mindanao province of his country where they do counterterrorism work. He's suspended joint naval exercises with the United States. He's talked about even junking the alliance, which he hasn't actually followed through on. The U.S. and the Philippines have, had, have been allies since 1951, and to undo that formally would be uh, a surprise even for Duterte. But he's speaking about turning away from the alliance, moving closer to China and Russia. And these are uh, real signs of, of what is for Duterte appears to be a really lifelong uh, animus toward the United States, and, uh, and he's really following through. Gordon, we have about two minutes. Go ahead. Um, David, um, don't you see the rest of the policy establishment in Manila uh, reacting to Duterte? Because it seems to be very pro-American, and there only seems to be so much that Duterte can do at the end of the day. That's right. There, there, there it seems that uh, there's probably a, a major natural check on his ability to shift away from the United States and toward China, and that is popular opinion. The Filipino public is very pro-American and very distrustful of China. And what we're starting to see is also, as you said, uh, the political class starting to turn a bit on Duterte. He remains popular with his violent anti-drug campaign, but just this week, the former president, Fidel Ramos, who might be the only politician in the Philippines more popular than Duterte, and he was someone who helped Duterte become president, wrote a scathing op-ed against him, saying that he is hurting the country with his tirades against the United States and other shifts that he's pursuing. And so that is a major sign that, uh, that you know, th- these things are up for grabs still in the Philippines, and, uh, and there could be checks both from the public and from the military, perhaps, which Ramos is very close to. So it's certainly something to watch. Uh, checks from the military, you mean they might see Duterte as a threat to the military? Is that what you mean? Well, the Philippines has a very long history of coups and right. attempted coups. Right. And uh, Ramos actually has played a role in preventing some coups against previous presidents. And Duterte has begun his campaign, his time in, in office, actually going to military bases regularly and promising to double the pay of mm. soldiers. This is believed to be a, an attempt to inoculate himself against some of this this kind of constant threat of, of coups. And so the fact that this talk is already churning with the intensity that it is in Manila after only three months is, uh, is certainly interesting. David Fyth of the Wall Street Journal Editorial. He's in Hong Kong. Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast. I'm John Batchelor.